My talk today is called ABLE FOIP, or always be integrating your loss function over your posterior estimate. So hopefully we'll have some fun. <laughs> Firstly, I work for Schmidt Futures. Um, Schmidt Futures is a philanthropic effort um, by Eric and Wendy Schmidt, our founders. And it is a talent-focused philanthropy, or philanthropic effort. We basically focus on people. If you can think of this top row here as being our people programs, I'll get into them in a little while, but we take really young people, raw, ta raw talented people, and we help them gain vision and exposure. We take people who are starting to prove themselves and we give them the resources to, to focus on a new exciting idea. And we take proven stars and we help them scale. How do we do this? Well, we've got explicit talent programs, but we also do grant making in a more traditional sense for enabling technologies. And what are these enabling technologies? Well, things like new data sets and tools, um, and also things like infrastructure, everything from dinner parties through to you know, trying to convince presidents of universities to create new departments. Just to give you a little bit of idea of what sort of talent programs we have going at the moment. We have uh, the, in the raw talent bucket, one of them would be the APMs. It's actually based on Google's associate product manager role. We take brilliant young people, these are like CS grads straight out of MIT and Stanford, and we put them, we give them really hard jobs, basically. We place them into uh, people who are, into teams who are doing very exciting work, normally slightly academic work. Um, and, and a whole bunch of training as well. Uh, an example of an innovative rising or mid-tier uh, program, talent program, is our Schmidt Science Fellows. This is a super exciting program. We basically get 20 of the world's smartest scientists, these are postdocs, and we pay them to change fields. So we take like a physicist and put them in a cancer lab, and they get training, and they get like a really, really good stipend, they get like double what you'd get in a typ typical postdoc. Um, and as an example of a, a scale level uh, talent program, we take like really senior academics, you know, MacArthur Grant winners, that sort of thing, and we help them get the teams underneath them in order to build out new infrastructure. So a great example of that is of some work we're doing with Sendhil Mullanathan at U Chicago. He's getting um, all this data from different hospital systems and creating a research platform that will allow people like you know, CS, PhD students to access data, health data, really high quality health data with only, you know, a couple of days of waiting once you submit your forms rather than having to, you know, do data usage agreements with the hospital system for six months. Really exciting work. My talk today is slightly on the career end of things. And it's because people keep on asking me what I do and I don't really have much of a word for it. I like to think of the world of data science as having three kind of tiers. It depends on like, essentially who the audience is and what you're trying to optimize. At the bottom here, these are tools for automation, the kind of you know, never take a perfectly good job from a computer sort of work. That's when you're building you know, tools they're going to use over and over, the whole notion of putting something into production. In the middle, we've got tools that augment the abilities of humans. So this could be anything from models that help you understand the world to I don't know, dashboards to uh, all this sort of stuff. Um, uh, A-B testing is a great example where you're helping, you're running experiments in order to improve product design. Um, at the top is this kind of field that does exist. It certainly exists, and I don't think we, we have a name for it. So I like to call it like executive data science. It's a sort of data science that answers research questions that senior executives have. And so this might be like strategic positioning. You know, what sort of product offering should a firm have in order to position itself within a market? Um, prioritization of management. You might want to think of, say, a customer lifetime value model as being not only a predictive entity, but a causal one as well. There are all those elements, all those parameters of a customer lifetime value model are actually things that you might be able to influence. You know, what sort of advertising campaigns or sales techniques or whatever or you know, effort of your organization can change the parameters in your CLV. Um, measurement of key results or KPIs, this is a really difficult thing to do. Uh, if, you're, if you're building key results or 
KPIs that are biased by the growth of a company, then they're not very good KPIs, right? You want to get scale invariant KPIs. And also, like basic economics, our macro view, how uncertain are we about the environment that we work in? So that's what I call executive data science. I think that data scientists have this unique toolkit to be really great executives. That's because we're like really cynical statisticians. A great um, cynical statistician is Deirdre McCloskey. She's actually an economist, but she teaches like English and history and all sorts of things. I, I think you should read this. I'll read it for you. If someone called, help, help, in a faint voice, in the midst of lots of noise, so it, that at the 1% level of significance, the satisfactory low probability that you'd be embarrassed, be, be embarrassed by a false alarm, it could be that she's saying, kelp, kelp, which arose perhaps because she was in a heated argument about a word proposed in a game of Scrabble, you wouldn't go to the rescue? And this really gets to the core problem of decision theory, okay? That we want to make decisions and we do have highly nonlinear responses given some piece of information. So, why should you think about it? Well, it's really intuitive. Um, you probably do it already. Uh, there are new R tools that can make this a, lo a lot easier, um, formally. But I don't even think you need to do it formally in order to get the majority of the benefit. You certainly should learn to do it formally, but it's one of those things where simply knowing that it exists, it gets you most of the way there. Knowing that something exists is you know, enough to put you in the frame of mind where you can start to incorporate uncertainty into your decision making in a more systematic way. OK, so let's use an example. I'm not a health person, I will happily admit. Um, but we're, we're going to look at a, a new type of chemotherapy. Let's say there's a, a definitely terminal type of cancer. It's, all, it's definitely going to kill you. And there's some, some medicine, some pill I can give someone. And I'll do a, a randomized control trial, and I'll see how much longer the treatment group uh, lives than the control group. Right? So I, get a, I run my RCT and get a causal estimate. There are a couple of wrinkles of this, right? It's costly to implement. Chemotherapy is horrible, OK? It, it's expensive. It hurts the person who's getting chemotherapy. And so it's, there's some cost to its implementation. It also has diminishing returns on, on welfare. So if you're like 85, you're probably going to die pretty soon, right? So extending your life on, uh, from this condition of like five years you might not value that very much because you might die of something else in that five years, right? You might not actually, get, or you might just be discounting. You don't really care about the future very much. Also, at the expected um, effect size, what we estimate in our model, it has a positive effect. You, you think, look at the expected value, I am better off in doing this than not doing it. Should you take it? Well, I haven't given you enough information, so let's take a plot here. So let's first of all focus on the middle one. That's our loss function. If it has zero or negative effect, let's just say that I incur the costs. I'm going to pay for uh, the medicine. I'm going to be really, really sick for a while. And if it, if it doesn't make me live any longer, I'm, I'm still going to die. So I'll just get like, really sick and poor for a little while before I die. And then there's this big bump. If it works a little bit, if it extends my life, then I'm happy. But by, by the time I'm down here, I'm probably going to die of something else. So if I'm pushing four years additional life, it's not going to help me. At the same time, we can take our posterior estimate of the treatment effect. Okay? And that's the, the bell curve here. We, we ran, ran, ran a randomized control trial. We get some estimate, and, and we get some posterior here. This posterior, it's got a, you know, I'm just going to say that the, the We'll call this like a p-value of like 1% or something, 1 and a bit percent. Masses of probability in the positive space. It is almost certainly going to work. Should I take the medicine? Well, I, what you need to do is integrate your loss function over this density. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you can ask yourself, how happy am I if the effect size is 2? If the effect size is 2, I can go down here and I can read off what the how sad I am. What if it's four? Well, I can read off how sad I am. What if it's zero? I can read off how sad I am. I can do that for all possible uh, treatment effect sizes. And then I 
I'm just simply taking the weighted average of this and this, and that gives me the posterior density times loss. And this is what I need to integrate. So let's, there we are. So the, the red bit here is bad, that's loss. I don't want red. The green bit there is, is happiness, right? That's additional life. So red bit, oh sorry, green bit minus red bit, or the red bit minus green bit gives me my net loss. And it turns out with this parameterization, although you would, you would take this medicine if you were a frequentist and just taking the modal estimator and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm better off at that point, you would not do it here. The loss, the expected loss outweighs the expected benefit from this medication. So, able FOIP. This is all you need to remember. Always be integrating your loss function over your posterior estimate. Easy to remember, easier to do. <laughs> okay, so let's talk, let's step back a little bit. We heard about stand before and, and posterior, so let's just talk about what a posterior is in a really easy to get setting. So take a simple linear generative model. We've got intercept, slope, and, and normal noise. So I can plug in any values of A and B and sigma into this. And for a given X, I can simulate some, some values of potential Ys, right? That's what makes a generative model. I can generate new data from it. What is it in practical terms? Well, at the moment, all I've done is like, I've drawn from my prior. I can parameterize this. I can simulate some fake data, but that data is completely meaningless. I want the parameter estimates I've got, A, B, and sigma, to have some bearing on, on the problem I'm, I'm working with. Okay, so we condition these values on Y and X. And if we've got small data, then we're going to especially get a lot of benefit from having sensible informative priors. The reason I became a Bayesian was because I was working in sub-Saharan African finance, and by the time one of our clients came to us, uh, they told us something important, which was we, we aren't dead yet. We haven't, we, our company hasn't exploded. The, the shocks in those tails that you see aren't nearly as big as the ones that are out there. So in practical terms, what we get from our Bayesian estimate is a posterior. And this posterior, you can think of it as being like a, a data frame. And we've got, this doesn't have a laser, but we've got our A, B, and sigma, and we've got all these drawers of A, B, and sigma from our posterior. Okay, so these summarize how uncertain we are about the values of, in our model, the parameters in our model. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, remember if we go back, I told you for any A, B, and sigma, I can simulate some values of Y. Okay, I can simulate my model. I can get some fake, val some fake data. So what I can do is for each, each row, each drawer of my posterior, I can simulate some fake outcomes with different actions. And an action might be an element in my model where I'm perturbing something, I'm saying, take the pill, don't take the pill, right? And I can simulate these uh, outcomes that might be additional life or, or whatever you care about. Now, for each of those, I have a loss function. And all I need to do is for under action one, I've got my, my posterior predictive drawers. For action two, I've got my posterior predictive drawers. And I just need to map each of those onto my loss function, okay? Because the, the outcome is the thing that I care about. And then I just take the expected value. I take the mean of these two columns. Now, statistical decision theory might sound complex, but all it is is doing this exercise for each of the potential decisions that you're making and make, taking the, the choice that minimizes your expected loss. That's it, really simple. The tools that you can use in R for this, um, the Stan family of tools are fantastic, as you all know. Um, so Stan itself is language. It's an amazingly expressive language. I do almost all of my work in Stan. Um, but there are two great RP, uh, APIs. We've got um, BRMS and RStanArm. They do similar things in slightly different syntax. Um, BRMS is building some really cool stuff at the moment, and so is RStanArm. Um, if you're more of a tree person, then Bayesian Additive Regression Trees, or BART, are really cool. They're great for if you go and run a randomized control trial and you want to estimate that response surface. So you've got some nonlinear response surface, then BART's a really, really clever way of discovering that. And so that's kind of most most associated with Jennifer Hill and Vincent Dory. Um, 
So there's Bart Machine, DBarts, and Bart Cores, other packages you might want to check out there. But they all have this, this really impressive feature, which is that they've got uncertainty in the parameters. OK, I told you a little bit about um, wholesale lending in sub-Saharan Africa. So the company, uh, company I advise, I used to be head of data, data science there, they do asset-backed lending in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is because domestic wholesale lending rates are really, really high. Um, and so Lendable just like basically takes these, you know, they, these companies who lend out cows or motorcycles or solar panels or whatever, takes those companies and plugs them into the global financial system. Right? So they are able to take their receivables and securitize them and raise wholesale rate amounts of money at attractive interest rates. So it does this by securitization. Now, what, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, these debt portfolios can have very, very high losses and very, very big shocks. This is not a risk-loss asset class. And so it really matters when you're evaluating the, and pricing a portfolio of debt you need to have some sense of what potential outcomes are out there. And as I said before, if all the customers who come to you exist, and they probably, probably do exist, um, but if they do exist and they haven't gone broke yet, then the, the tails that you see in their data are way too small. And so you need to use um, sensible prior information about the, how big shocks can be, OK? And so we simulate the cash flows from this uh, from, the, from a portfolio of debt. And you could take each of these lines and plug it into a cash flow waterfall. Anyone who's ever worked in finance knows that there's like this entire accounting system that goes alongside uh, the equity prices and the dividends, that sort of stuff. So people own these receivables and they get paid off and lawyers get paid off and there's something for exchange rate and all that sort of... Uh, so it depends when the, the cash flow happens. Um, it has different values. And so you need to take these... Um, these cash flows and plug them in through your accounting system and only then do you get to aggregate across those and get an economically meaningful decisionable quantity. What is the expected gain to the business of, of buying this portfolio at different prices? So we built that and kind of automated it and it kind of runs in the cloud every day. Okay, so example three is with philanthropy and this gets past the world where we have data on anything. Okay, so I'm trying to make investments in people and in projects that haven't even happened yet. This is not even causal inference, this is like storytelling. Okay, so what we need to do is think. And one of the ways of thinking is, you know, if we're like crass utilitarians, we might think, look, the further someone is away from me, well, I draw, draw a circle around myself, and make that circle bigger and bigger and bigger. And there are going to be more people who are, whom I could potentially affect the bigger that circle is, right? And, you know, this circle might be time. It might be how far into the future I'm willing to look, okay? Or it might be network distance. So how many, you know, shared connections away do I, do I need to go in order to access a, a larger network? Or it might be space, you know? Am I considering the welfare of people in Chad or New Zealand, which is a very long way away? Um, so... As you go further away, you get a, a lot more people you could potentially affect. At the same time, my ability to affect them, at the moment, I'm, I'm torturing you with decision theory, but if you're outside, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be troubled by that at all. So my ability to affect you is diminishing in the distance, and that might be distance in time, it might be distance in, in distance or in network or whatever, but I'm, I'm going to have less effect on you. Now, if you're a philanthropist, what you're trying to do is maximize your impact on the things that you care about, right? So you really want, the, you want to integrate your effect size, which you're uncertain about, over the number of people, number of units or utils. You know, if you, if we, you know some of the crazy utilitarians like to think about us all being M's simulated in the, in the cloud in the distant future. And how much weight do we want to give those things? And so this can help you guide the, the distance at which you are likely to have the biggest impact. Now, of course, this is going to vary depending on what you're investing in um, and, and what sort of tools you have at your disposal. Thank you very much. We're exactly on time. <laughs>